Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's DAS webinar, the RIA's Guide to Digital Assets. Today's episode is made possible by BitGo. I'd like to invite our speakers to unmute their lines and turn on video. During the webinar, please submit your questions to our speakers through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll save some time at the end of the discussion to answer these. The session will be available on demand. All registrants will receive an email once the recording is live. I'd now like to turn the event over to BitGo Chief Revenue Officer, Pete Najarian. Pete, please go ahead. Thanks, Julie. Um, uh, hello, all. We, we are uh, delighted to have you join us for another uh, of our Black Works group um, series. This has been a great series of conversations we put together um, with some, some of the best speakers in the crypto universe and some folks that really come, um, come at this space from um, great backgrounds, both within crypto and, and you know, crossing over from other asset classes. Today, we've got um, Rick and Sunaina, who I think are gonna, do, are gonna be a fantastic um, panel. The topic is the RIA's Guide to Digital Assets. Um, I, this is a particularly interesting one uh, for those of us that, that grew up in, in other asset classes and have crossed over in the last several years. A quick plug about BitGo. Uh, we were the first to launch a complete front to back solution that now allows um, really a full stack, one-stop platform for liquidity, insured custody, crypto lending, portfolio and tax tools, um, and all that done in a, in a single secured environment. Uh, we we believe this was what the market uh, was demanding, and so as we've delivered it, we've found that to, to be validated, and, and we're excited to continue to grow. Um, again, delighted to be part of this group, and delighted to uh, be working with the BlockWorks team. And with that, I'll turn it over to Michael. Thank you. Um, awesome. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Pete, and the folks at BitGo for making this all possible. Um, really, really excited to kick off today's session, which is the RIA's Guide to Digital Assets. Um, as Pete kind of mentioned, this is a subject that's been near and dear to my heart as well. Um, I think uh, the RIAs are kind of the, the elephant in the room that no one's really uh, directly speaking to in, in crypto, with the exception of the two people that I'm lucky enough to be uh, joined by today. So if we could just do a quick round of intros, uh, Rick and Sinena, before we kind of dive in here. Rick, I'll, I'll call on you first. Uh, well, thank you, Michael. It's great to be here and, and wonderful to be again on the stage with Sinena, um, who I'm, uh, I'm a huge fan of. Uh, I am um, the founder of the largest investment advisory firm in the country and more recently have created the RAA Digital Assets Council, which we refer to as READAC. Uh, I created this organization because I've been spending an awful lot of time over the last decade in the area of blockchain and digital assets. First became aware of blockchain and, and the subject in 2012, uh, made my first investment in Bitcoin in 2014 and quickly discovered that this is an emerging new asset class and is worthy of consideration by financial advisors. I've also discovered that most financial advisors know very little about Bitcoin and it's easy to dismiss out of hand. And so I created the RAA Digital Assets Council to provide an educational platform for financial advisors to help them learn and understand it. And we're launching in Q1 the first ever certification uh, for financial advisors in blockchain and digital assets. We can talk more about that as the program goes on, but I'm, I'm really glad to be here with you, Michael. Thanks, Rick. Sunaina? Awesome. Thanks, Michael. And hi, everybody. My name is Sunaina. I am uh, the global head of digital assets and blockchain at TD Ameritrade. Really delighted to be here with Rick. We're part of each other's mutual admiration society. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, what I'm th I've always looked up to Rick, who's not just been a pioneer, uh, you know, in building up the RIA space, but has often been the leader in terms of embracing new technologies and kind of then proliferating those technologies with his con with his credibility through education. And, you know, we've had several opportunities to collaborate in really educating uh, the RIA community on uh, kind of the merit of blockchain, the technology, and also Bitcoin, the asset class, and hopefully, you know, through this webinar, continuing to build up that crypto quotient. I uh, want to do a quick shout out to our friends at BitGo as well, and to the BlockWorks group. Uh, I would completely concur if you guys haven't had a chance, go check out all the series of webinars that they've been putting out. Uh, frankly, for me, it's been a nice pivot from all the binge watching I've been doing to also integrate a little bit of binge learning uh, into my media diet. So 
So thank you for doing that, Pete and Michael uh, and Julie and others. And this topic is just so near and dear to us. And I'm really glad that, you know, they saw fit that to dedicate an entire webinar to uh, the RIA community. Um, as mentioned, for us at TD Ameritrade, you know, leaning into blockchain, the technology, but also Bitcoin, the asset class, just was a logical, uh, you know, moment. You know, we really looked at it as a continuity of the ethos upon which, you know, TD Ameritrade was founded, but really the brokerage industry was founded, which is, you know, leveling the playing field and bringing Wall Street to Main Street uh, and really, you know, breaking down those barriers so individual investors and advisors were empowered to take charge of their financial freedom and enabling for them best in class platforms and products and education that otherwise was, you know, in the past reserved for just a few. So for us, you know, engaging with this asset class was just, yeah, this is the logical next step. And we're kind of delighted to have, you know, taken the leadership position with some of our other friends in the Wall Street community and kind of continue to proliferate the benefits uh, of this asset class, but also doing it in a way that's balanced so that the new wave of market participants, whether they're the RIAs or, you know, individual investors are entering into this ecosystem with, you know, prudence and purpose and pragmatism. So really looking forward to spending over the next hour and double clicking into some of those nuances, um, you know, with our friends in the RIA community. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Sunina and Rick. I'm really excited to, to kind of get into this. And ultimately, I think the, the purpose of this um, webinar, as both of you said, is to address um, kind of the RAs in the space and to give some perspective on why um, this particular group of people is so important to the future of crypto in this space. So I guess let's just start off really with the basics. Um, we're lucky to be joined by some advisors on this call, but for those who aren't, um, either Rick or Sunina, could you just give almost a basic overview of what an RIA is and why they are so important to speak to in this space. Maybe just touching a little bit on the sheer amount of assets that they control and the clients that they work with and all that kind of good stuff. Rick, why don't you start? <laughs> uh, okay, Sanana, since I am a financial advisor, I'll, I'll tackle this one. Um, <laughs> you've, you've summarized it very nicely, Michael. The uh, What frustrates me a lot uh, as I spend a lot of time at crypto conferences and talking with folks in the crypto space, there's a an awful lot of really nifty products and services that are being developed that have already been developed. And, and Pete described uh, very uh, succinctly the, the terrific uh, work that they're doing. And that's my dog in the background hearing. Uh, by the way, my dog's name is Satoshi, but we won't go there. <laughs> that's amazing. That This is why we do this for the little gems like that, actually. <laughs> so so um, what... Uh, what I discover when we're talking with folks in the crypto space is they're, they're busy building nifty, whiz-bang, cool stuff, products and services. And when I go to conferences, they are filled with folks in the crypto arena. Uh, I remember when I spoke at Consensus a few years ago, there were a thousand people in the audience. And I went on stage and I said, all right, everybody in the room, raise your hand if you're a financial advisor. Five people raised their hands. Everybody in the room was in the crypto space. And all they're doing is talking to each other all day long. And, what, and then they, uh, and one big lament they all have is how come we're not figuring out how to get people to buy our products and services? And the problem is they're talking to each other and they're not gonna buy and sell each other's products. Uh, and they're trying to reach the ultimate consumer, meaning investor, the person who's buying Bitcoin and other digital assets and, and needing the services and underlying product systems to be able to facilitate their ability to invest in this space. But if you go to someone with a million bucks and you convince them to invest in Bitcoin, great, you, you make a sale. And what are they going to do? Put one or two or three or four percent of their assets into Bitcoin. So you just succeeded in getting a small sale. You move on to the next customer. That's an incredibly inefficient way of doing it. And you're never going to create scalability going one by one by one. What you need to do instead is recognize that most of the investors in this country rely on investment advisors, people like me. Uh, our firm is the largest in the industry. We have 1.2 million uh, families and individuals around the country who are our clients. We're managing over $200 billion in assets. And there are RIAs around this country that are collectively managing more than $4 trillion in assets. Uh, we are the gatekeepers. Our clients 
invest in what we tell them to invest in. That's why they're our clients. You go to the doctor, you take the drug your doctor tells you to take. That's why you go to the doctor. And that's why you go to an investment advisor. So if you want to make headway and you're in the crypto space, you need to reach the advisory community. Uh, and most in the crypto community don't know to do that. And they don't know how to do it, even if they figure that out. And part of the problem that we've discovered, Mike, is that many in the crypto space don't know how to talk the language of advisors. They talk the techno babble of blockchain and DLT and DeFi. Advisors have a level of concerns, a set of interests that are different from what typically you find in the crypto community. And so that's why I created READAC, the RIA Digital Assets Council, to serve as a bridge between the crypto community and the RIA community, because I, I live in both worlds and I'm able to speak the language on both sides. And uh, those in the crypto community, if you're engaging in this conversation, you have to begin to learn how to reach the advisors, because until you win over the hearts and minds of the advisors, you're never going to really achieve the scalability that you hope. Uh, it's advisors that are controlling the bulk of the assets in this country, and it's they're the ones who are uh, being listened to by the bulk of the wealthy investors in this country. And that's what you need to do is learn about the investment advisory community. READAC is really the organization designed to exactly help you do uh, exactly that. Interesting. So one of the things that I took away from what you just said is if you've been in crypto for any period of time, you've probably heard this phrase, the institutions are coming, right? People love repeating that phrase, right? And who they typically refer to when they're talking about that is pensions, they're talking about endowments, foundations and the like. Uh, and it seems like, it's just funny because there's this huge pile of assets, right? That's controlled by financial advisors, RIAs, and ultimately whose money that is, is regular people, high net worth individuals. And the reason why that makes sense as a pile of assets that's more likely to come into crypto is because that's primarily kind of retail driven. And that's, to, to this point, uh, crypto has been a retail driven phenomenon. So I guess um, I'll open this up to, to both of you. How do you both speak to advisors who are looking at the macro in Bitcoin and saying, what's going on, right? Even if you look at the last month, you've seen PayPal uh, just rolled out uh, crypto trading. Even just, uh, you know, over the course of this webinar, BitGo has gone, you know, across $13,500. You're seeing all these things and just wondering, how do I understand the space and how do I get involved? How do you speak to your, your clients about this? Well, well first I'll, I'll lay out the, the foundation and then Sanena can provide the, the better answer to your question. The foundation is understanding who these advisories are and who they serve, because you're right, it's not the endowments and pension funds of the world. For the mm -hmm. most part, advisors are serving a group of American individuals, the mass affluent, people with less than a million dollars, the affluent, uh, or what we call the high net worth, people with the low seven figures, the ultra high net worth, people with 20 to 50 million, and the family office, which are people with more than $50 million in investments. Most investment advisors are dealing with the high net worth and above, people with a million dollars or more to invest. Most advisors have a um, hundred or so, a couple of hundred clients. Uh, some of the bigger firms might have collectively five or $10 billion in assets. But you're right, Michael, you, the crypto community needs to target investment advisors who are serving the uh, landscape of American households, wealthy Americans across the country, to help them understand why Bitcoin and other digital assets belongs as part of a diversified portfolio. And Sunina can elaborate on that piece better than me. Yeah, happy to happy to uh, build on that. You know, I think going kind of combining your first question with this is, you know, I I, I you know I I did uh, a few years ago write my CFP, uh, but I've never practiced it as an advisor. But I have a lot of empathy and appreciation for what the RIA community does. And I think the other piece that's really important to understand about this constituency is at the heart of it, they're also small business owners, right? You know, they, you know, they, they, they are building, uh, you know, a business that's geared towards helping everyday Americans, you know, reach their financial freedom, but also achieve life goals, right? Sometimes with money management, we get so admired in the money aspect, but we forget people are saving and planning because there's a bigger life goal that they're trying to achieve that's near and dear to them, right? So when I talk to RIAs, that's the thing that, you know, always gives me goosebumps is they have this awesome responsibility of, you know, building relationships, 
helping to manage money, but not just managing money for the sake of managing money, that there are these real tangible, important goals attached to it, right? So, and I think that point is important because it helps us really understand the mental model. You know, uh, Rick did a good job of helping us understand kind of, you know, the asset class levels that the, uh, that the RIAs manage. But one of the other things is that the clients that the RIAs work with, they also have different mindset. They're different from the active traders, right? Who I, I, I feel like the crypto community talks to a lot and many of them are comprised because they kind of want to be left alone and do it themselves. But clients that work with RIAs choose to do that because they want almost like, you know, uh, Google Maps or Waze, uh, you know, to help them get to where they're going, right? It's more of that, you know, mindset of, I want to collaborate with somebody, I want to work with somebody. So, and I think understanding those nuances is helpful, because when you then speak about digital assets, and the importance of this asset class, you want to make it analogous to those goals, you want to make it analogous to that mindset. And I think that's the approach we found has been super helpful is, and I agree, you know, get rid of all of the technical speak and to some aspect, even the ide ideological speak, because this new wave of market participants, as they come into digital assets, they're really attracted to this asset class for more of the pragmatic reasons. Now, they may or may not believe in the ideology, but I think that's less important now than it was a few years ago, maybe when we were all coming into it. You know, they're really looking at Bitcoin or digital assets as a whole as a form of diversification, perhaps that, you know, uncorrelated return uh, or the narrative of digital gold. So I think it's important to understand those nuances those expectations so you can have a dialogue that's more conducive to that outlook versus you know you know great you know we may have read the white paper we may be you know enamored by the technical aspects of bitcoin or the ideological aspects and that's great but for somebody else that might not be the logical entry point or the need or the pain point they're trying to solve so i think trying to understand is important you know the thing i'll end with is uh, you know, Rick and I had, were grateful to host a one-day education session with the RIA community at the end of January before the world completely turned on us. And, you know, at one point in our opening, it was a room full of thousand advisors, and we asked the audience, raise your hand if you think Bitcoin is a fad. And barely any hands went up. And Rick and I were kind of looking at each other because we thought a lot of hands would go up and we had all the right, you know, arguments about why it's not a fad. And we're like, wait, what just happened? And so we followed up and said, how many of you would have raised your hand a year or two years ago? And pretty much the entire room went up. And it was even an aha moment for us as engaged as we've been with the RIA community that while the initial entrance market participants in crypto were maybe the sophisticated traders or retail participants, and there's a lot of chatter about bringing in the institution, it's really the RIA community that's really at this inflection point. And, you know, and I think that's why, you know, re the outreach to them is so important. And one of the key drivers that we're seeing, you know, the confluence of current macroeconomic condition, you know, the shift in demographic. And for the RIA community, what's top of mind is, the trillions of dollars in generational wealth that's starting to transfer, which will only be amplified in the coming years, you know, behooves them to be leaning into this because the new clients that they inherit will be different from the parents with whom they were working and will have different expectations and different needs. And I think putting that all together, I think the timing is so fertile uh, for the digital assets community to get connected with the RIA community. Let me elaborate on that because Samina is absolutely right on everything that she said. Um, the, the real key that, that I want to highlight from her comments is the fact that the REA community does not have a level of interest that, it, that is the same as the crypto community. The, the best analogy I can give you is automobiles. I don't know or I don't think I can explain the principles of internal combustion, but I know how to drive a car and that's the difference is that investment advisors want to understand the role of digital assets in a diversified portfolio. How do you choose digital assets? How do you buy them? How do you categorize them? Are they on alternative asset class? Do they belong in the equities asset class? Uh, to what degree do you invest? Do you put 1% of assets there, 2%, 5%? 
Uh, do you buy the asset directly or do you do it through a fund? What are the tax and regulatory implications of doing this? What are the record keeping obligations with doing this? How do I explain this to my client? How do I track the performance and report the performance? These fundamental basic practice management questions are what advisors want to know the information of. And if you're going to spend as a crypto provider, all kinds of information about combustion engines, you're gonna lose the audience because that's not what matters to advisors. Yeah, they, they do wanna know and they'll learn that as a matter of course of along with what they're doing, but they are far more practical focused to tangibly understand how do I integrate this into my practice? How do I talk about it with my clients? How do I make it additive for my clients and our ability to help them achieve their goals? That's really what it comes down to. And most in the crypto community don't get that. And many in the advisory community are frustrated because when they try to get this information, they are bamboozled. It, be, it becomes very opaque. It doesn't become very apparent and easy for them to get. And that has been, I think, a big impediment to a, creating broader adoption. And there's one final point that I'll mention. The one key question that I haven't raised that advisors are asking that nobody in the crypto community ever wants to deal with. And it's this one. As an advisor, my question is, how do I get paid? Remember, advisors are managing assets and we collect a fee on the assets we manage. If I put these assets into Bitcoin, how do I collect my fee? And until the crypto community is effectively able to answer that question, none of the rest really matters a whole lot. That is a phenomenal point. I'm going to actually turn that right back on you. And what do you answer when you inevitably get asked that question? Because I think you're totally right. Economics, drive, you know, it's like the Charlie Munger quote, you show me the incentive, I'll tell you the outcome, right? And right now, the incentives are simply not there for the RIAs to really participate in the space. So what do you say, or, you know, when you get asked that question and how do you eventually see the RIAs getting paid so that we can move, you know, begin to move these assets into the space? Well, I'll give you a short-term answer and a long-term answer. Uh, the short-term answer is that there are products available in the marketplace today that allow advisors to uh, recommend them to clients, to manage them for clients and to have it as part of their compensation model with clients. So they do exist in the marketplace today. They tend to be a little more cumbersome than many advisors would prefer because of the nature of those assets. They're closed funds, they're uh, hedge funds or they're uh, private equity or venture capital uh, or uh, limited partnerships or what have you. So they're structured in a way that is not as convenient or easy or liquid or low cost as advisors might like, but they do exist. The long-term answer is a 40 act product is an, a Bitcoin ETF as a first product and, and ultimately followed by a variety of other ETFs and 40 act products that invest in a variety of trading platforms and uh, diversification tools that allow advisors to use uh, a Bitcoin ETF the way that we currently can use a gold ETF. When the first gold ETF came to market, more than a billion dollars was put into it by RIAs in just the first two weeks. Uh, and so that is really the holy grail for the IA community is uh, an ETF. But uh, it is not likely that while Jay Clayton is chairing the SEC that that's going to happen uh, anytime soon. So uh, for now, advisors, I would say, have to muddle through. Why should they bother muddling through? Why not just wait for the ETF? Because the sooner you invest, the lower the price is likely to be. So those who invest today in a cumbersome way will be rewarded by getting in relatively early compared to waiting for an ETF, which might not be for a year or two or three or who knows what, by which point the price may be significantly higher. So there's a reward for the cumbersome element of early adoption. Yeah, and Mike, if I can build on that, I think the price sensitivity is critical. Um, I think the other point is also the risk of attrition, right? So when I speak to a lot of our advisors and I say, so why now? Like, you know, I'm glad you're finally wanting to talk to me and learn about this, but why now? One of the key things I hear about all of the things we've talked about in terms of diversification, asset allocation is, well, my clients are asking me about it. Right. And, you know, as, as I tell even my most crypto skeptic uh, friend, it's totally OK to be skeptical, ask tough questions, formulate your own opinion, but it's no longer kosher to be apathetic. 
right? And the RIAs realize that because they can't be glib about it. They can't just tell their clients, oh, don't worry. Like, you know, it's nothing because in a way, Bitcoin especially is getting normalized more and more with each day. You know, let's just look at over the last three to six months, right? You've got, you know, macro traders who got a lot of credibility, like, you know, Paul Tudor Jones coming out and elaborating on their thesis uh, of why they're investing into Bitcoin and doing the compare and contrast to gold, which people can understand and synthesize, right? Number two, you we just heard the announcement of PayPal, right? Like think of the mass distribution and reach and everybody and Venmo is kind of a verb. So people understand that, right? You know, you have publicly traded companies like, you know, the likes of Square and others that are starting to add Bitcoin to their balance sheet. And one of my favorites that just came out recently, uh, a very eloquent and thoughtful research paper from JP Morgan of all places that really outline the benefit of including, you know, crypto in your portfolio and Fidelity did the same thing. So as you know, as, as you see these names and brands that you know and recognize uh, kind of come out and speak about it in ways that is analogous to what we already do, it's getting normalized, right? So RIAs are having this awakening that, oh, wow, like, you know, I need to be part of it. Uh, it's no longer this rogue thing happening on the side. And then the second their clients are asking about it and, you know, they themselves have to be educated and informed so they can guide their clients because if they don't, the clients are going to go elsewhere. And as any small business owner knows, any business of any size knows, once you open that small crack, right, of attrition, then it's hard to kind of bring your clients back. So I think there's that. And then the last thing I'll just say is, you know, as somebody, I spent my career at this nexus of tech and finance and policy, and I've seen this over and over again, you know, whether it was with mobile or cloud, and now we're seeing with this, it, it, to use the Hemingway quote, you know, it's slowly at first, then all at once. And I feel like with digital assets, we're at that inflection point where it was slow and steady, slow and steady, but we're starting to have a bit of that Cambrian explosion. And it's a critical time for the RAs to kind of start to engage. Yeah, I'd like to add on that as well. I think Selena is, is completely correct that advisors have no choice because of the questions that clients are asking. Uh, clients are asking because their children are talking to them about it, you know, and, and we've already seen the study from Schwab that show among millennials, GBTC is the fifth most common investment they own. They own GBTC, the, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, more than they own Netflix or Microsoft or Berkshire Hathaways. So clearly, the younger generation is heavily engaged and they're telling their parents about it and their parents are asking their advisors about it. And the advisor can not simply be dismissive saying, oh, it's a fad or it's a fraud. That's too simple and easy. And the advisors are being dismissive because they themselves lack the knowledge and education. So they're not able to have a more serious conversation. So here's my point. My view is a little bit different from others in the crypto community because I'm not of the crypto community. I'm of the RIA community. So I don't really care as if you as an advisor buy Bitcoin. I don't care if you like Bitcoin. I don't care if you want to recommend Bitcoin. I simply care that you know about Bitcoin, that you are knowledgeable about it so that you can talk intelligently with your client. As a financial advisor, I am not a fan of annuities. And I am in the camp of not liking uh, fixed annuities or most variable annuities. And I don't like the sales practices of those who sell annuities. And we routinely warn our clients against annuities. We do not put annuities into our client portfolios. But guess what? I'm an expert on annuities. I can talk to anybody to any length necessary about why I don't like annuities and the concerns and problems that I feel exist with annuities. So that when my client calls me and asks, Rick, what do you think of an annuity? We can have an intelligent, measured conversation to help them understand why I'm giving them the advice I'm giving them. I don't simply say, oh, annuity's bad. You know, I, that isn't going to cut it. I'm not doing my fiduciary obligation if that's all I'm doing as an advisor. So my challenge to advisors are, if you need to learn about Bitcoin so that you can decide for yourself whether or not a given client should or should not be investing in Bitcoin. And if they should, how should they do it? Where should they do it? To what extent should they do it? So that you as a fiduciary can protect your client from doing it wrong. Buying too much, 
paying the wrong price, going to the wrong platform, because we know it's a, not a regulated environment yet. There's still a lot of fraud and abuse and scams. You have an obligation to protect your client, and you can't do that if you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I think education is such an important point, and it's something that we've learned in, even in our own journey as we've kind of been building up our digital assets practice is that, you know, education is the silver bullet, right? And it doesn't matter, you know, what segment you're, you know, trying to reach, whether it's the institutions, the RIA, the individual investor, the active traders, you know, and, and we've seen that in our 40 year old history that when you lead with education, you, it, it results in a more empowered investor and an empowered investor is a more successful, committed investor for the long term, right? They're not jittery in and out and, you know, they, they, they have a goal, they have a plan and they're doing it with kind of credible information and education. And I would submit that when it comes to digital assets, education is even more paramount, right? Just given the nascency and perceived complexity of this asset class. And, you know, when, when anytime we have a conversation with any of our constituents, internal or external, including regulators, it really starts from a place of what are your questions? Uh, and the more skeptical you are, great. It, it's an opportunity to turn more detractors into advocates, you know, but let's start with education before leaping into anything. And, uh, you know, and, and I think for the RIAs, what they have going for them right now, the tailwind that they have is the voice of the client, which frankly was one of the strongest um, things I could ask for as a business leader to build up my business case and bring along my board and the senior leaders and regulators about why a company like TD Ameritrade ought to lean into this because the clients are asking for it, right? There's nothing better to build your business case than the voice of the customer. So use that as kind of jump off point, but to go back to what was said earlier, as you're building for it, make sure that, you know, you're really looking at it from your client's eyes and building it for the constituents that you're serving, right? Same approach we took at TD Ameritrade. We're not building this practice to cater to institutions like hedge funds and pension funds. And there's a lot of other great people doing that. And, you know, and their approach is going to be different and that's okay. We're myopically focused on, you know, looking at it from the lens and the client's eyes of the individual investor in the RIA community, thereby our decisions on, you know, product design, uh, how compliance will be part of the DNA, or, you know, the experience uh, is going to be catered differently. And so that would be my one humble, you know, learning uh, that I would extend to the RIAs is kind of tune out the noise and really focus on your clients and looking at this from their eyes, which they already do, and, you know, and building a real roadmap and strategy accordingly. Awesome. And guys, I'm just going to use this time here to remind the folks in the audience that we're going to have time for Q&A at the end. Uh, so it's very rare that you get to ask Sanada and Rick uh, any questions that are on your mind. So uh, if you have questions, definitely tune in. Um, so I, I want to actually dive in on, on something that both of you were saying before there as well with um, kind of the difference in demographics, right? There's a big shift in demographics that's going right now. There's an aging population, but also millennials are coming into more money as well. I think this might be a point that you both disagree on a little bit. If you look at the, the value proposition of something like Bitcoin, and if you look at the value proposition of something like gold, they both purport to be very similar, right? They're a store of value. They're supposed to be a kind of a hedge against uh, central bank and propriety or, you know, kind of the fiat system. Do you think that it's a, it, one thing that gets said a lot is that, well, millennials have more of a preference for Bitcoin, and therefore you can expect more millennials to own Bitcoin than, um, than kind of their, their parents. Do you agree with the sentiment? And is that going to be a major driver of adoption over the next five or 10 years? Or agree or disagree, I guess, on that point? Um. One, one of my favorite conversations and it often happens with folks that are still crypto skeptic is this notion of fact versus FUD, right? And for those of you who don't know, you know, FUD is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, it's, and one of the FUDs I hear is, well, you know, and this is whether you're a big company or a fintech or maybe an RIA is, well, we want to lean into it, but it's really only for the kids, right? Like the TAM, the total addressable market, sorry for the jargon, you know, the TAM is really small 
And, you know, how do I build a business case with it? And let's be honest, you know, we all in our organizations work with finite amount of time, talent and capital. And it's a prudent question to ask, why would I dedicate it to this when the business opportunity is small, right? And I think that alludes to the point you're making is the segments that are attracted to it are kind of the kids, the younger generation, the millennials. Well, first of all, as a millennial, we're not that young anymore, right? We're growing up, you know, we're having our own kids. So, you know, so so we're not the, you know, the troublemaking uh, insouciance that we were a few years ago. So, so I think, you know, they're kind of taking that kids part out. Um, but the other thing that, you know, touched on is, sure, the entry point might be through the younger demographic, but they're bringing their parents and grandparents along, right? You know, separate from me, you know, my younger brother in his early 20s, his first entry into capital markets was when he first bought, bought Bitcoin, and which, you know, my mother's chagrin. But he's the one who then educated my mom about Bitcoin and helped her understand the notion of digital gold. And, you know, she's Indian. She loves gold. She understands gold. And so her entry point into Bitcoin was through her 20 year old son. Right. So that adage that Rick used, like social media is a great example. Right. It wasn't that long ago when, you know, quote unquote, grown ups were like, oh, social media is a waste of time. But now they're on every social media app because that's how they stay connected to their kids. So. Yes, the entry, A, I kind of disagree with that the entry point is just kids because we're seeing it cut across dem demographics. But even in cases where the entry point might be skewed to the younger generation, that's okay because they are helping to bring other demographics along. And that's fine by me because, you know, A, from a generational transfer of wealth, that will be helpful. And I think that the comparing, compa I mean, people love to do the compare and contrast to gold. And I don't know that it's, hey, if you buy Bitcoin, you can't buy gold or vis-a-vis. -vis. I think it's all about diversification. They serve different purposes. And one of the last things I'll say about gold is what, what we, and you know, the difference between gold and Bitcoin to keep in mind that we learned during the COVID crisis was, you know, with all the supply chain issues, at the height of when people really wanted gold as a hedge, getting access to gold was not easy because there was production issues. You couldn't really produce a lot of, you know, gold and there was this complete, you know, a flip flop of supply and demand. Well, guess what, with something like Bitcoin, there was no supply chain issues because you don't have the same constraints, right? Um, so I think that is a differentiator, but I would just say, we're not saying, hey, if you like gold, you can't buy Bitcoin, or if you like Bitcoin, you can't buy gold. I think again, that you know you can make the choice you want across the proportions that you want. Um, so, so sometimes I feel like it's maybe a bit of a, you know, moot debate, but over to Rick to agree or disagree. <laughs> Here's the thing I don't understand. Uh, for some reason, Bitcoin has been placed into an argument and people feel they have to win the argument. Bitcoin is good, Bitcoin is bad. Bitcoin is better than gold, Bitcoin is worse than gold. Bitcoin is for millennials, Bitcoin is not for boomers. Bitcoin is for the young, not the rich. Why is this an argument? Why is it a fight? Financial advisors believe, first and foremost, if I can summarize the investment management strategy of virtually all established financial advisors in this country, the one word that describes their strategy is diversification. Investment advisors recognize that highly concentrated approaches is speculative and risky, and it is not something that most consumers, most investors are interested in doing. Diversification wins. Uh, and most advisors are pretty good at building highly diversi diversified portfolios. But while doing so, that portfolio is going to have, in the world of stocks, small cap, mid cap, large cap, US and foreign, it's gonna have growth and value. It's going to have emerging markets uh, in the world of bonds, short term, intermediate, long term, high quality, high yield, U.S., foreign, um, government and corporate. It's going to have natural resources, oil and gas, precious metals, exponential technologies. You're going to have 15, 16 asset classes. And I'm willing to bet that a given advisor has in their diversified portfolio an asset class or market sector they don't like but they do it anyway because it's part of a diversified portfolio. So why is there suddenly a prerequisite that the only way you can add Bitcoin to a diversified portfolio is you have to like it. 
you should just do it because it's an asset class, whether you like it or not. It's part of a diversification tool. It has negative correlations to other asset classes. It reduces the volatility. It reduces the risk. It can help to improve the returns. You don't do it because you like it or don't like it. It's not because I'm doing this, I'm not doing that. It's not a question of gold versus Bitcoin. Why is there an argument? I don't get it. And this is the point that I think everybody has to get beyond. We need to simply understand that there are always early adapters and early adapters tend to be younger investors. That has been the case on every innovation that we've ever had in society. I assure you the first person to drive a car was not somebody 60 years old. And I assure you that the first person to fly in an airplane was not somebody 60 years old. And the first person to buy Bitcoin was not 60 years old. So what? Once you get past early adopters, you then get into the mainstream because that's where the money is. And clients of all ages, all assets, all education levels will buy Bitcoin because they will begin to realize it's part of a diversified portfolio. And the advisors who help them understand that will be the advisors who are more successful than others. It's that simple. Woohoo! Pragmatism prevails. I love it. That was impassioned. I was, that was amazing, Rick. I, uh, so I have a question for both of you then. So uh, Rick, you mentioned that just in the US, there's about $4 trillion that's controlled by RIAs. Um, you've been a big kind of proponent of exactly what you just said, which is you don't have to love it, but you at this point should either at least have an opinion and be educated, but ideally have some even small amount of exposure to Bitcoin just because it's a new asset class. It's part of a diversified portfolio. What does a world where one to 2% of RIAs getting exposure to Bitcoin look like? Does that meaningfully change the space? Do you think that starts off, you know, there's a, you know, kind of like a, a FOMO type thing where other, um, other pools of assets kind of comes in? What does the future look like where one or 2% of all of the assets that are being controlled by RIAs gets involved in Bitcoin? Well, we'll just do the math. If, if, uh, if every advisor were to place every client 1% into Bitcoin, and you've got four trillion of assets being managed by advisors. Well, what's one percent of four trillion? Um, you would have such an incredible increase in the price of Bitcoin for the simple reason that Bitcoin's supply is fixed. Unlike many other asset classes where that isn't the case, um, the fact that you have such a supply-demand structure of Bitcoin means that as the demand rises and the supply cannot, it forces the price of Bitcoin to go up. And this is why I fundamentally believe so many people are fundamentally excited about the Bitcoin's pro, uh, prognosis and not just Bitcoin, but a great many other asset classes in this space uh, or other assets such as Ethereum, Litecoin, Ripple, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that there's a huge opportunity here because of the nature of these assets and the limited supply uh, that exists. So the demand can only cause the supply, the uh, price to increase. Um, Notwithstanding that, you're going to see continued volatility because of the winds of investor sentiment. We've seen that in, in Bitcoin. Uh, the halving has an implication as well, which is jargon for those unfamiliar with the space. Um, but it's, uh, we think that as you get increased adoption, um, the FOMO kicks in, uh, where those who are not investing are going to uh, fear uh, of not being invested and they're going to want to get involved increasingly an advisor is going to feel compelled if all the other advisors are doing it because the clients are going to say, why am I not in this? Why did you, did you not recommend this? It hurts the advisor's credibility. So the early adopters are going to be the biggest beneficiaries and the later adopters are going to join the party because they're not going to have any choice. All right. Well, we're, we're nearing the end of the time that we have for our for our interview. So I'll just, and we're about to dive into kind of audience questions here. So I guess um, just either one of you closing thoughts on everything that we've talked about, um, just the involvement of RIAs, why it's necessary to get them involved in this space, what this might look like. Just anything you want to kind of close out on before we move to audience questions. Sanana? Yeah, listen, as bullish and enthusiastic as, you know, we are about digital assets and hopefully that exuded uh, during this webinar, I, you know, I'm, I'm equally empathetic that, you know, even the RIAs who've been wanting to lean into this, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 it's sometimes a bit of, a, you know, pushing molasses up a sandy hill, right? That, you know, the, 
uh, that, that it's not the lowest hanging uh, fruit. And at the end of the day, human nature prevails where you kind of go, well, I'll just do the thing that I've always been doing and that's easier to do, right? And so I think taking that balanced approach, hopefully what we've conveyed today is you want to pursue this with purpose. Like, why are you doing it? You know, have a very clear business statement because again, understanding that, you know, uh, our, you know, the RIAs are have a fiduciary responsibility. They're not building and shipping a photo sharing app and saying, ah, if we break it, we'll fix it later. Not that I think you can do that with a photo sharing app anymore, that they have to be very prudent and pragmatic in their approach, right? So I think a few things that have maybe kept the RIAs and the sidelines is, you know, one, there hasn't really been a playbook, right? So even the RIAs who wanted to lead into it, you know, I, you know, I'm a pilot, so I'll use the analogy if it's like you're flying your plane while you're fixing your plane, which is not a desired situation. But I would say that, you know, it's changing and changing very quickly, right? Even in the opening that Pete did of the work that Bitco has been doing, right? It, the, the, the barriers to entry are slowly being kind of broken down. And there is a playbook starting to formulate that the RIAs can very simply and quickly apply to their practice to extend this to their clients. So I think that's important. The other thing I often hear about is, I want to do it, but you know, this space is not regulated and there's no way my compliance and risk people are ever going to let me go anywhere near it. First of all, I would say you want to bring your BFS from legal compliance, risk, privacy into the game from the get go, right? Don't, don't kind of keep them out, bring them in, get them involved, let them have skin in the game and help you get to where you want to get to. But I think the whole notion of this isn't regulated is frankly a lame argument now. Uh, and, and, and we are starting to kind of see that regulatory ambiguity shift into more of the clarity side of the ledger. You know, recently the news from OCC, um, you know, CFTC. So a lot of regulators are really leaning into it and putting out guidance that's super helpful. So I think that's important. Um, and, and I think ultimately, as we've said again and again, is, you know, a few years ago, something like, you know, talking about Bitcoin to your, uh, you know, decision makers in your organization might have brought with it a lot of operational and career risk, frankly, right? I got into it in 2012 when I was working at iBank and there was no way I was telling anybody in investment banking that I was, you know, interested in this rogue thing called Bitcoin. Never did I think it would kind of become my job and that's happened very quickly. So I think a lot of the career risk is evaporating as marquee brands and people with credibility like PTJ and even Rick and others are vocalizing why, you know, this is an asset class with a lot of merit. Um, so I think, you know, the time is right. So start with education, formulate your own opinion, and know that there is a lot more of a playbook and plumbing in place today that didn't even exist a few years ago. And that's only going to get better and better in a compounded manner. Um, so, you know, skate to where the puck is going. <laughs> Yeah, I would simply say that, um, ironically, the more experience and education that an advisor has, the more of a disadvantage they're at. Because at a brief glance, Bitcoin seems to violate everything we've been taught as financial advisors. It looks like Beanie Babies and Tulip Bolts. But when you get beneath the surface, you begin to realize there's a there there. There's a real technology. There's a real use case. There's a real legitimacy behind this. Uh, but don't worry about being convinced. You need to simply need to arm yourself with the tools you need to be able to say to your client, whatever it is you want to say about this space. If you don't like it and you don't think it's safe for your clients to invest, then explain to them why and you need that knowledge. On the other hand, if you think it is something you would like to handhold them through to protect them, they do it effectively and safely, then you need, again, the information to be able to help them do that. It all comes down to getting, as Sinema said, the education you need to give yourself the knowledge necessary so that you can effectively, as a fiduciary, serve your client's best interests. Thank you both so much. Um, that was really, really enlightening. Um, I, I definitely want to make sure that we've got, we've got a bunch of audience questions coming in here. So I want to make sure that we have time to get to all of them. Um, so Rick, this, this first one is actually directed towards you, and I'm going to build on it just a little bit. Uh, so, Rick, why is a Bitcoin ETF the answer to an RIA's exposure problems? Digital assets are bearer assets, and your clients would not have direct ownership of those assets via an ETF. 
only exposure. And I actually want to dive one level further there because something that you brought up, Rick, um, earlier was that the incentives don't quite exist for RAs to get involved. And I think a lot of people, maybe not the RAs on this, on this call, but don't understand what the business model of an RIA looks like and what the revenue streams are for an RIA. So if you could actually just start with that, what is the business model and kind of how do RAs make money? Um, and then also then move into why an ETF um, is the answer to the, the RIA exposure problem. RAAs tend to make money in one of two ways. Uh, the majority, the vast majority, earn an asset management fee, meaning we receive the client's assets, we manage those assets, and we charge a fee based on the value of that account. As the account goes up, our fee goes up, account goes down, our fee goes down, everybody is on the same side of the table. There's no conflict of interest. Uh, we custody those assets, typically at a firm like TD Ameritrade Schwab. Um, uh, where they serve as the brokerage platform for the buying and selling the securities based on the instructions that the investment advisor provides. It's a discretionary account. The advisor controls the buying and the selling uh, on behalf of the client. So if, uh, if a platform will not allow us to buy Bitcoin, then I have to move those, that money to somewhere else. And the somewhere else may not facilitate our ability to collect the fee that we would otherwise collect from uh, the client's account. So uh, that's the way most advisors get paid. Some advisors, uh, especially those dealing with higher net worth clients, family offices and the like, they're often not charging an asset management fee, they're often charging an annual retainer fee, a flat mm -hmm. fee of 100,000 a year, for example, regardless of how much money is involved. Uh, and in that case, they don't care where the money is custodied because it's not affecting their comp. Um, that's easier for them to tell a client, uh, go to a XYZ platform to buy Bitcoin there. Um, so advisors, for the most part, who are dealing with an AUM fee, want to use a brokerage platform, and that means they want to do it in a security. Uh, and Bitcoin is not a security, and therefore isn't available on most custodians' platforms. Uh, so you're dealing with the limitations of the RAA business model in that regard. And, and, you know, maybe getting to the second part of that question, which was... Oh, yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. Um, you're right. If you, go, if you buy a synthetic, meaning you can go to a platform and buy Bitcoin directly, that's the pure way. Same thing with gold. You can go buy gold coins or a gold wafer or a gold bar. That's the pure play. But as soon as you go one step removed, you are uh, muddying it a bit. And you could certainly make the argument that the best way for someone to engage in digital assets is to buy the digital asset purely, not through a fund. That's true, but most advisors aren't going to care because they have practice management considerations. They wanna make it simple and easy for the client in terms of how you buy it, how you hold it, how you maintain record keeping, how you handle tax reporting. You wanna have it with a, some semblance of safety doing it through a security that provides SEC regulation. There are other factors to consider that might not be as pure, but it's better than nothing. Great, thanks, Rick. All right, Sanina, I'll, I'll direct this one to you here uh, because the, 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 the voice of the client and client demand is something that you've talked about. So will financial advisors' investment in Bitcoin be demand-driven by client inquiry, or will it be supply-driven by an ETF, qualified custodian services, et cetera? Um, I'm going to be a politician and say both. Uh, and I think both of those both of those are important and kind of catalyzing the growth. Um, I would say the most important tailwind uh, for uh, you know decision makers in any organization of any size to lead into this, especially if you're an incumbent, is the client demand. Right, because it's hard for people to kind of shrug it off and say, hey, I can't really look into it when you've got a lot of your clients asking for it. And that really honestly was the, 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 the component that jettisoned our journey because you know we put a simple bug on all of our um, uh, mobile, uh, mobile apps and website asking a simple question. Are you interested in crypto? Do you want to trade crypto? Are you trading crypto? Thinking, hey, listen, if 100 people answer, you know, it's some validation from my team and I. And we were astounded, you know, thousands and thousands of responses consistently and persistently. And that in itself was my business case, right? So I think from an RIA perspective, definitely capitalize on that incoming client demand and all the reasons that's important that we've articulated. And I think on the supply side, 
Um, I think choice is good. You know, uh, Rick mentioned happening uh, a little while ago, which happened in May. If you look at the biggest impact of happening or having or to the price of Bitcoin today, a lot of the volume uh, and you know impact of pricing is happening in the derivatives market, right? Well, guess what? Four years ago, when the last Bitcoin happening happened, there was no derivatives market. So there's you know it's it, it's evolving very quickly, and the number of on ramps and instruments for clients to engage with this asset class is coming to bear really fast. I know we've touched on the ETF journey and you know that's kind of taking a while, but I think if you look at the evolution of the spot market, you know, the coming of the derivatives market, the managed product. So I think there's a lot more vibrancy and diversity today, which is helpful. So I would say it's the combination of the supply getting better uh, and then the demand continue to, continuing to accrue. That's great. Um, okay, so uh, I think we've got time for one more question here. I saw one that I wanted to get into. So um, I'd love to get, so some governments are getting into their own cryptocurrencies, which are known as CBDCs or central bank digital currencies. What impact, if any, do you see this having on kind of the market and potentially the price of something like Bitcoin? Uh, I think this is very favorable. Uh, Bitcoin is not a currency. It is therefore not threatened by central bank digital currencies. Bitcoin is an asset class. And I think that central banks creating their digital currencies will create legitimization uh, for the space of digital assets. So I think this is very good news uh, for um, assets such as Bitcoin. Uh, and the difference uh, that might be surprising to some folks, what's the difference between a, uh, a digital currency and a digital asset? What are stable coins and ICOs and tokenization? This is all this complicated aspect of the space you need to get familiar with. And that's why we've created, as I mentioned at the beginning of our program, Mike, our certification program at the RAA Digital Assets Council. You can go to our website at riadac.com, uh, R-A-A-D-A-C.com. We're launching a first ever certification for financial advisors so that you can set yourself apart. Not merely you have the knowledge, but you'll be able to brag to your clients and prospective clients that you have the knowledge. Uh, and it's uh, gonna launch in Q1 for $500 to go through the program. But if you sign up by the end of this month, it's just 399 and you get 10 CE credits. So we think it's a hell of a bargain, a hell of a way for advisors to get their continuing ed and set yourself up so that you get the knowledge you need and differentiate yourself from other advisors. So I'd encourage you to go check out the REA Digital Assets Council. Uh, and you'll learn, for example, of why central bank uh, digital currencies are not a threat to Bitcoin. Anina, anything to add? Um, I agree with the aspect that, you know, all of these things bring more awareness, uh, more normalization, and hence more Leg uh, you know, uh, leg legitimacy to the ecosystem. Um, you know, when the whole Libra hearing was happening, I think they gave the Bitcoin community the biggest gift because of the hyper awareness and the conversation and the zeitgeist and the interest. And we saw the correlation in terms of our clients' demand for education and access to digital asset really spike up when that was in the zeitgeist. And I think that's only being fueled by current macroeconomic condition. You know, again, I, you know, knowledge is power. The more you know, uh, the more empowered you are. Um, you know, just from a balanced perspective, I would say there is some of CBDC activity. I often wonder if it's more about chasing shiny objects and FOMO driven. There are some CBDC use cases of like, what problem are you exactly trying to solve for? Which is a question mark. But I think the more governments and regulators are leaning into it and getting educated and getting engaged, I think it's really good for the digital asset community and ecosystem. Perfect. Um, and for those interested in hearing more about uh, stable coins and central bank digital currencies, we're actually doing a webinar later this week on Thursday uh, with the CEO of Circle, uh, Jeremy Allaire and Mr. Anthony Pompliano. So uh, if you want to do a deep dive there, that's, um, that's a great uh, resource for information. So Nina and Rick, we're drawing near the end of our time here. Thank you both so much. Um, for those who want to find out more about you, and Rick, we've actually had a couple people now ask about your certification. Where, what is the best way that people can get in touch with you? You just go to our website, riadac.com. That's R-I-A-D-A-C.com. Great. Sinaina? Yeah, you, you can go to tdameritrade.com or you can find me personally on LinkedIn or on Twitter at Sinaina. 
Um, you know, whether you're kickstarting your journey or scaling your uh, digital asset journey, happy to be helpful. So, you know, reach out, stay connected and continue the conversation. Thank you guys for organizing this. This is so glad that you're paying attention to the RIA community. Of course, thank you. And again, a big shout out and thank you to Bitgo. Uh, they've made this entire series possible. Any advisors on the phone that are, are on the line that are interested in learning more about this and, and specifically if you wanna investigate uh, custody solutions or ways to just interact with the market, they are definitely the firm to go to. Uh, Sanina and Rick, thank you both so much again um, for doing this and uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks. Awesome, thanks everyone. Cheers, thank you. Okay.